Want to see an example of two Microsoft products playing nice? Well, how about instead I'll show you how to consume Azure ML models from Power BI, as well as some of the messy problems you're likely to run into along the way. Welcome to this video on Azure Machine Learning. My name is Kevin Fiesel. I'm the proprietor of Catalyxy Services LLC, a consulting firm which specializes in work all across the data platform space, especially SQL Server. The prior video served to tell the story of what Azure Machine Learning does well in comparison to alternative approaches of machine learning development. At the end of that video, I teased this one, where we're going to access a real-time Azure ML model from within Power BI. Because the easiest way to tell this story is to show you directly, let's jump right to the demo. Here we are in Azure Machine Learning Studio. Quite some time ago, I spun up an Azure Container instance, and I can see that if I navigate to the Endpoints option in the Assets menu, in here, I have a real-time endpoint called Chicago Parking Tickets. By the way, in case I haven't ranted about this recently enough, I don't particularly like the name real-time here because I don't consider REST APIs over HTTP as real-time. In classic computer science terminology, these are really online systems, not real-time. I like to explain the difference this way. With online systems, you can expect a response quickly enough that you can remain engaged throughout the process. A form that takes a few seconds to load data is a good example of an online system. By contrast, real-time is what it sounds like, in real-time. Avionics software in a fighter jet is real-time. If it takes a few seconds to respond to something at Mach 1.5, well, you're potentially threatening a pilot's life. We're expecting responses in microseconds there, not seconds or even hundreds of milliseconds. Anyhow, diversionary rant over. Let's jump into the Chicago parking tickets endpoint. If I navigate to the test tab, we can get an idea of what our input data needs to look like in JSON format. And if I strike that test button, I can see what my resulting output looks like. We've gone through this in great detail in prior videos, so I won't belabor this particular point. I just wanted to show you that the service is still up and running. Now I'm gonna switch over to Power BI Desktop. I have a brand new report with no data, so let's rectify that. I'm going to need uh, input data in the same shape as what Azure ML expects. I could, of course, use Power Query to reshape that data if I need to, but this isn't a Power Query video. Instead, I'm gonna take some pre-shaped data that we've used already in this series. Let's navigate to Get Data in the Home tab, and then I'll select Text slash CSV. Then I'll navigate to the Practical ML Ops with GitHub and Azure ML repo, then to Pipeline, and Data. By the way, I'll leave a link to this repo in the description below so that you can get the data yourself if you don't have it. Inside the data folder, we have two files. I'll choose Chicago Parking Tickets 1.csv and load it. I don't need to make any changes to the input data, so I'll just load it as is. This takes a moment or two, and now I have a data set. Let's right click on the data set and then choose Edit Query to take us back into Power Query. By the way, I could also have clicked the Transform Data button originally instead of selecting Load. There are multiple ways to get to Power Query. Now I'm going to select the Azure Machine Learning button from the AI Insights submenu in the home ribbon. From here, I need to sign into an organization account, so let me do that. Once I'm signed in, I can connect and I get an error message that no AML models are available at this time. It takes me to the URL, aka.ms slash Azure ML PBI. On this page, the relevant bit is that I need to grant access to an Azure ML model to a Power BI user. To do that, the user needs read access on the Azure subscription and the Azure ML workspace. But that's not really the problem I'm experiencing. I'm the owner of the subscription and the workspace. Instead, the core problem is that the real-time service we set up, not supported by Power BI, we're going to need to use one of the older V1 web services. So let's switch back to Azure ML Studio and fix that problem. I'm going to navigate to the Models tab and then choose the first version of my Chicago Parking Tickets Code First model. 
From there, I'll select Deploy and then choose Web Service, the third option on the list. In this series so far, we've focused on the first two options, real-time endpoints and batch endpoints. Now we're going for the third. I need to fill in this form here, so let's give it a name. Chicago Parking Tickets Web Service. We are limited to 32 characters for the name, so don't get too creative. I'll switch the compute type to Azure Container Instance. And then for a web service, we're also going to need two more files, an entry script file and a conda dependencies file. Now, we had created a scoring file for prior videos in this series in order to perform batch processing. Because we're going to want to use an Azure ML v1 web service endpoint, we will need to create a new scoring script that looks a little bit different. Let me show you what we need. Our scoring script still includes two functions, init and run. The init function is still responsible for loading the appropriate trained model. Let me compare this init function to the one we used for batch scoring, as there are a couple minor changes. First, notice that we do not retrieve workspace details in the managed online endpoints scoring function. This is because the Docker image Azure ML will build for us already has details of the subscription, the resource group, and the workspace, and so we don't need to retrieve those details from anywhere else. Also, we aren't operating within the context of an experiment's run, as this is an online endpoint for inference, so we don't have a job run to read. For this reason, the method to get model path will not include the workspace, but it will still work fine for our case here. The other function we need is the run function. For batch processing, we dealt with many batches, some number of text files we needed to process in one batch. Now the input is our payload, and we have these funny at input schema and at output schema tags on the run function. These come from a Microsoft library called inference schema, and they are necessary for Power BI to interact with this Azure ML endpoint. Basically, they serve to create a signature for what we need to send in and what we will get back. The way we create them is simple. We build an example of each of these in action. The input sample variable here is a pandas data frame, and I've used one real example of the data to let the inference schema library, well, infer valid shapes and data types. For output, we're expecting back a numpy array with one numeric value per input record. That's why on lines 43 and 44, we see two different parameters type, a pandas parameter type for input schema, specifying that this will be in the shape of a pandas data frame, and a numpy parameter type, specifying that the output will be an array of integers. We're also going to need a conda file, specifying libraries we want installed. This file is also pretty similar to the one I rigged up for batch processing, though there are a few additional libraries we'll need to install, such as joblib, nump, the Azure ML inference server, and inference schema. We didn't need any of these for batch scoring because we had a separate way of loading the data. I'm also installing the Azure ML v2 SDK for good measure, though we don't absolutely need it in this conda file. Once I have the two files in place, I can select deploy and let her rip. Of course, this is a new service going to an Azure container instance, so we're gonna need to be patient as it deploys. So don't mind me, I'll be twiddling my thumbs for a bit. Okay, now that we've got the service set up, the next thing for me to do is grab the URL of that endpoint. So let me copy that. Now I'm gonna switch over to Postman to try it out. I have a test rigged up and waiting for a URL, so let's paste that in. Before I run it, I do want to point out a couple of things. First, one thing I noticed was that this input was quite sensitive to column order, so I needed to include the columns in the exact order that our scikit-learn pipeline wants them. This is a bit different from the real-time endpoint or batch scoring scenarios where we could realistically have the data in any ordering. Admittedly, I could probably make that run function a bit more robust to get around this, but that's fine. This is for demo purposes. Now, 
Let's hit send and we can see our results. An array of results for whether payment is outstanding. All right, so we're in good shape here. Now let's go back to Power BI and bask in our glory. Uh, let's close this window showing no models and select the Azure Machine Learning option again. And still nothing. Okay, another possible issue you can run into involves caching of results. Let's fix that. I'm going to select Data Source Settings from the Data Sources menu in the Home ribbon. Then I'll navigate to Global Permissions and we can see an option for Azure Machine Learning Functions. Let's clear those permissions and then choose Delete. Now I can close all of that and select Azure Machine Learning once more. I'll have to choose my account and this time we get, well, we still get nothing. Uh, this is the point where I am legitimately frustrated. And that's because there's one extra requirement that Power BI doesn't really tell you about. It's not quite a hidden requirement in that you can infer it from some of the documentation, and I'm sure it's actually written out somewhere, but the app won't tell you this. The account that you're using to connect to Azure Machine Learning needs to be a Power BI Pro account. And the problem is, my Azure Resource Group and Azure ML Endpoint are tied to a Gmail address. So that means I can never have a Power BI Pro account for this user because they don't accept common personal email address providers like Gmail or Hotmail. Now, fortunately, I do have a separate Power BI Pro account tied to an Azure subscription where I can deploy models and web services. So I'm gonna switch over to that now. I have here an endpoint that I've already created using the same Azure ML model I trained in prior videos in a different workspace. By the way, if you wanna know how to do that, here's the quick version. Let's go back to my workspace and then the models tab. Inside here, I'll select Chicago parking tickets code first model. Then I can navigate to the artifacts tab. From there, we can see all of the artifacts. And if I drill into this folder, we've got a few files. I can select the download all button to get a zip file of these model artifacts. I'll want to unzip those files and rename the output folder to trained underscore models so that it matches what I have in my workspace. Then in the new workspace, I can navigate to the models tab there and choose register from the menu. Then I'll select from local files based on framework. If I want to create a V1 style web service, which is the key to this entire point of this video, I need to choose this option. I can give the model a name and then I need to choose a model framework. I used scikit-learn version 0.24.2 to train this model originally. So I'll choose scikit-learn from the menu and then I'll enter 0.24.2 in the framework version text box. Then I can select upload folder and navigate to where my trained models folder is. From there, I can register this model. And that's exactly what I did to get this Chicago parking tickets code first model over here. All right, let's go back to the endpoints menu and I'll select Chicago parking tickets web service. I can see its URL, so I'll copy and paste that and we'll try it out in Postman. So let's paste in the correct URL and make sure that everything still works. I'll hit the send button and yes, we get back the results we expect. So life is good here. Okay, fifth time to charm Power BI. So once again, I'm gonna select data source settings from the data sources menu on the home ribbon. Then I'll navigate to global permissions and we can see the option for Azure machine learning functions. Let's clear those permissions and then choose delete one more time. Now, when I select Azure machine learning, I'm going to choose my other account, the one that has Power BI Pro associated with it. And suddenly, for some definition of suddenly, we get one Azure ML function available for us. It's a festivist miracle. Assuming you get this far, now things get a lot easier because Azure ML reads the input schema and knows what to look for. It also does a good job matching my Power Query table columns to the appropriate input parameters for the Azure ML call. 
If for some reason I need to change some columns, flip things around a little bit, I can choose which column I intend for each input using the dropdown on the right. Once I'm satisfied with the results, I can choose OK, and that creates a new column at the end of my table in Power Query. It'll take a moment for Azure ML to spit back all of the results, but once it does, we have a column with a bunch of zeros and ones. I'd like to rename the column to something a little more understandable, so let's right-click it and choose Rename from the Context menu. I'll call the new column Payment is Outstanding. I'm also going to right-click again and change the data type to Boolean, as that's ultimately the appropriate data type for what we're getting back. Let's close and apply those changes. That'll take just a few moments to finish up, but once it's done, we're ready to do whatever we desire with the data. If I drill into the Chicago Parking Tickets 1 table in the report view, I can see all of the columns. This isn't really a video on visualization, so I'll create one or two simple visuals and we'll call it a day. Let's bring on a clustered bar chart. In the Y axis, I'm going to put payment is outstanding. On the X axis, I'll also drag on payment is outstanding, and Power BI is smart enough to know that I want a count of this. We can see that we expect most of the tickets to be paid. Next, I'll bring in a line chart and put issued year on the X axis. For the Y axis, I'll drag on payment is outstanding, and that will give us the count. And in the legend, I will also include payment is outstanding. That will break this out between true and false values. We can see that old tickets issued 20 or so years ago are more unlikely to be paid than not, according to our model. There's more that we can learn from this data set, but that'll do for now. Well, that was a bit of an ordeal. I know it's not the ultra smooth, just click here and it magically works type of demo, but it is a realistic experience. Yes, there is a bit of pain involved, but I would still lay the claim that this is still easier than a roll your own solution, particularly if you want to provide multiple services to a variety of end users. The fact that we had to create a new type of scoring script and deploy to a new type of endpoint did bump up the complexity level, of course. But once we got that sorted out, as well as requirements for a pro or premium account, the actual integration is pretty smooth, which admittedly is like saying that once you get past all the choppy wind caused by that low-grade tropical storm, it's all smooth sailing from here. We'll have links and show notes in the description below. And until we see each other in the next video, Take care.